Hi, I'm Eric Lerner. I'm Chief Scientist with LPP Fusion. Welcome to the sixth episode of The Real Crisis in Cosmology. In the last episode, we saw how Hannes Alfain's theories of the formation of large-scale structure in the universe could explain these structures in some detail without a Big Bang using just the well-known processes of plasma physics and gravitation, well observed within the laboratory. But, as we've emphasized in this theory, theories have to be tested quantitatively against observations made after the predictions are, are published. So, that's what we're going to do in this episode. An important feature of comparing these results with observation came about because of Alfane's discovery during the 1960s on both theoretical and observational grounds that for plasmas, velocity is scale invariant. What that means is that on all physical scales, from the very small to the very large, in plasmas, similar phenomena happen at the same velocities. So that's very good for comparing laboratory with astrophysical processes, because it means that the smaller the object is, the faster the process goes. So astrophysical processes on very large scales that take millions or even billions of years can be scaled down to transient phenomena in the laboratory. For example, a galaxy 50,000 light years across with a rotation velocity like our own galaxy of about one rotation every 200 million years scales down to a five centimeter wide object with a rotation velocity, uh, with a rotation time of only 0 0.6 microseconds. In 1957, Winston Bostick experimented with small blobs of plasma that he called plasmoids. And he showed that in a matter of microseconds, these little blobs would naturally form through the action purely of electromagnetic forces, models of spiral galaxies, which at the time was reported on the front page of the New York Times. After Hannes Alfa developed his theory of structure formation in the late 1970s and early 1980s, one of his students, Tony Peratt, used supercomputing facilities to simulate the same process that Bostick observed, but on a galactic scale. In this little video, based on billions and billions of computer calculations, he showed how two blobs of plasma without any gravitational interaction would form themselves into the familiar spiral galaxies that we saw. Now, this is where my contribution to this part of the field comes, comes in. I had met Winston Bostick in the 1970s. By that time, he was working on a fusion device called the Dense Plasma Focus. That's the same device that LPP Fusion is now researching to develop a cheap, clean, and unlimited source of energy. He introduced me to this device, which I found fascinating. And in the early 1980s, I developed a theory using this device and the processes that occur with it as a model for astrophysical phenomena such as quasars. And you can view a lot more about these theories in the other videos that we put in the uh, description section. In the course of this research, I found on both a theoretical basis and confirmed by observations 
that there are two critical velocities for plasmas that are forming filaments. The first, around 160 kilometers a second for a hydrogen plasma, is the velocity at which filaments tend to form. The second, 1,000 kilometers per second, is the velocity for uh, plasma to move within the filaments. Above 1,000 kilometers per second, the filaments tend to become disrupted. So this velocity of 1,000 kilometers a second sort of puts an upper speed limit on objects forming in the universe, a speed limit much lower than the 300,000 kilometers per second of the speed of light. So this allowed me to make quantitative predictions about Alphane's general theory of large-scale structure formation. In this chart, velocity is plotted in the vertical axis as the logarithm of nr squared, because we're talking about gravitational orbital velocities, which are proportional to the density, n, of an object times its radius squared. So the upper limit is here right above 46. That's 10 to the 46. And uh, the lower is just above 10 to the 44. The symbols you see here, clusters, galaxies, and stars, are where these objects are actually located on the chart. And in fact, the orbital velocities of clusters, galaxies, and stars all fall within these limits of 160 to 1,000 kilometers a second. But there's another firm prediction that comes out of this critical velocity. In order for an object to collapse gravitationally, it has to be what's called collisional. In other words, a particle, say a proton, has to hit at least one other proton and be deflected before it crosses the object. If this isn't true, then the protons will simply move in static orbits and will not be able to share energy in order to contract. That's like the planets in our solar system. The solar system's planets are so far apart that their gravitational interactions don't destabilize the solar system. And the solar system has remained the same radius for billions of years. But when particles get beyond this critical density so that they are collisional, then they can share their energy and then they can gravitationally contract. Well, the velocity of a particle moving in a plasma is closely related to its collision distance. In fact, the collision distance varies as the fourth power, the square of the square of the velocity. So if we know the velo top velocity, then we know the collision distance will only be dependent on the density of the object. Therefore, product nr, density times radius, is a constant. And the theoretical work that I did on this 1,000 kilometers per second velocity predicted that nr should equal 10 to the 19 particles per square centimeter. And that sounds like an astronomical amount, but particles like protons are very tiny. So what it actually adds up to is the surface mass of about 1 one hundredth a piece of plastic wrap. So it's actually a very small amount of matter. If you look at this chart, along the bottom, the horizontal axis, you see the logarithm of nr. So if you take 
the logarithm of nr to be 19, 10 to the 19. And you take the gravitational attraction, uh, the, the gravitational orbital velocity to be 1,000 kilometers a second. And up in the upper left corner, where these blue lines intersect, you get a prediction of the size and density of the largest objects that exist in the universe, the primordial vortices. This is what I referred to in the last episode as the critical dimension that plasma filaments had to grow to before they became gravitationally confined. Now, this was a prediction made and published in 1989. The first hints of these extremely large-scale superclusters of galaxies came in that same year. But it wasn't until much later that we found firm evidence in many surveys of the large clusters of clusters of galaxies that are spaced, just like the predictions, a few billion light years across. So this was a quantitative confirmation of the general theory. Now, what you see on the diagram is basically a schematic of the quantitative process in which the objects form. So if you take the first object on the left, clusters and superclusters, the green lines show lines of constant density. So if you project those lines down to the vertical line, the critical NR line, you get the mass of objects that will form out of plasmas that are the size of clusters and superclusters. If you then project the red lines, which are lines of constant mass, back up to the region of the critical velocities for orbital velocities, you get the dimensions of galaxies. If you do this exercise again, with the green lines being lines of constant density, and the red lines being lines of constant mass, then you get to the final stage, the stars. And you can see that by the very nature of this diagram, these steps get bigger and bigger. The difference in size between stars and galaxies is many, many orders of magnitude greater than the difference in size between galaxies and clusters of galaxies. There are huge distances between the stars compared with their size, much smaller distances between the galaxies compared with the galaxy diameter. Now, of course, the sizes of stars galaxies and clusters were known before I published the paper back in 1989. So this was consistent with what was known, but was not a true prediction. However, the prediction of the existence of primordial vortices, that was a true prediction that was not known before this paper and has been abundantly confirmed after this paper. So. In both quantitative and qualitative terms, the process that we described in the previous episode involving simply the pinch effect, gravitational contraction, and the homopolar generator effect can produce the universe as we see it up to the point in which the stars started to form. Now, why could this process not continue even uh, within the stars. That also was ex easily explained on the basis of plasma theory. For the filaments to form, the plasma had to be magnetized. A magnetized plasma means that electrons or other uh, particles go around the magnetic field lines very many times before they 
accidentally collide with another particle and are thrown off in a new direction. In all interstellar and intergalactic plasmas, the plasmas are indeed magnetized. But when you get up to the density of stars, which are comparable to the density of water and beyond, that's no longer true. They're so dense that the collision uh, rate is greater than what's called the gyro frequency, the frequency at which particles gyrate around the magnetic field lines. So the same process of filament formation can take place within the bulk of the stars. Now, in the much less dense gas that's around the stars, the same process can and did take place. And as Alphane detailed in many papers, this led to the formation of the planets and the satellites around the planets. In the next episode, we'll see how this story of cosmic evolution connects with the increase in energy density. If you want to understand the significance of energy density to present day life on Earth, please watch our new video, Pandemic, Economic Crises, and the Energy Density Solution. Like, share, and thanks for watching.